we get started, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me just so that you kind of know um, where I'm coming from and what my perspective is, because it is surely not all encompassing of folks who live here in Alabama. Um, but um, I am a lifelong native to Alabama. I was born in Daphne, right um, across the bay from Mobile near the beach um, and uh, grew up there until I went to college at Auburn University, which is about um, 45 minutes north of Montgomery. Uh, graduated from there, um, had the opportunity while I was there actually to um, intern at a local organization in Montgomery uh, called Aid to Inmate Mothers in 2015. And um, that uh, internship put me working in Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women during 2015, which if you guys know anything about that, um, it's, it's rated as pretty much the worst women's prison um, in the country. And during 2015 is actually when the feds were coming in and investigating. So that was a, a very eye-opening experience um, for me um, and really led me to want to stay in Alabama. I was so here's the thing, um, when you are a quote rising star in Alabama and you grow up here, people expect you to move away. Um, there's a big uh, you know, saying here that you know, Alabama's biggest lost resource is brain drain from its young people. And I had a total plan because I, I grew up a lot more liberal than my parents and than my community. And I had a total plan to graduate from Auburn and go somewhere else and um, working that summer uh, in, in Montgomery and in Wetumpka at the prison changed all of that for me. Um, I, I realized that um, you don't have to go to New York to do the work and in fact the work happens in every community and there's no better people to be doing the work in the community than the people who uh, like you know own it like have been here for forever and have that perspective that native perspective so I stayed, I moved to Montgomery right after college. Um, I ended up working at a local education nonprofit doing um, community organizing for parents and schools. Um, so if there's two points I want you to take away from today, it's, there, it's that Alabama is way less red than our electoral map tells this country. Um, first of all, Doug Jones won in 2017 if you needed any um, current <laughs> examples of that, but gerrymandering and voter suppression is why our state looks red when really our population is actually very purple. Um, the and, and one of Tabitha's best talking points from the campaign we were on there is that Alabama isn't actually, it's not 80-20 Republican, it's 60-40 Republican, which is way more of an even split, um, even if we're presented as 80-20. As and so that's one thing um, that's huge to take away. And then the second thing is that Alabama and the South as a whole is under invested in or actively divested in by national philanthropy and political money. So um, those two things <laughs> come together to kind of shape the landscape of what Alabama is, but also some of the potential that we have in the future. Um, I had the opportunity to run a congressional campaign in 2018 for a Democratic candidate in the second congressional district here. Um, Tabitha and I were friends before. Her husband uh, was my pastor. Um, and when she decided to run, I was 23 and she was like, you know what, let's just do it together. Um, for context, the district is um, bigger than, um, mo is one of the biggest congressional districts in the country. So it's 10,000 square miles and very rural. Um, so we spent a lot of time in the car <laughs> together, um, driving up and down dirt roads and door knocking in trailer parks. And I loved it. It was, um, one of the biggest life-changing experiences for me personally um, and it taught me a lot about the people of Alabama and politics of Alabama and sometimes how those things don't actually align a lot and how very much so the national narrative about Alabama does not align with what actually happens here. So let's talk 2018 very quickly. Um, Tabitha did lose so we won our um, our primary in June uh, by a landslide. We got to work very, very early on that. Um, and one thing that's different about Tabitha than all the other Democratic candidates um, from years past is that she was like, no, we're gonna run a real campaign, even when people pat us on the head and go, oh, sweet, sweet girl, like you think you can do this. Um, and that's what we did. So we started out of the gate strong. She hired me full time as a, as a campaign manager very few Democratic campaigns, um, unless they're statewide in Alabama, have full-time campaign managers because we're just super under-resourced. 
One huge challenge that we were up against in our state is on our national, on our ballots, at the very top, we have this option of straight party voting. So if you just bubble in one little bubble, you vote for every Republican candidate down the ballot. You don't have to go one by one. That is killer to any Democrat. It is, it kills us because um, people who wanna vote for Trump but might vote for a Democrat in their local election, that stuff happens, they are less likely to do that because it's just easier to fill in that one bubble. Um, so we were up, we knew we were up against that big hurdle. But what we noticed is that we could actually get people to think a little bit more critically, but it took travel and it took face-to-face -face conversations. So, um, you know, the whole thing about Southern culture being very hospitable and like nice and everybody wants to talk to you and give you a hug, that's true. And so that's how we have to do political organizing here. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times we we pulled up on this house that had, they just like had their screen door like wide open at the, you could just walk into their house and you walk up and these people don't know who you are and they're like, come on in baby, you want some sweet tea? Like, let's talk. What are you doing here on a Sunday afternoon? You know, I loved it. It makes my heart pitter patter. Um, so that was incredible. And that's the way you have to do politics here, even when you don't agree. And so what we noticed was, first of all, ensuring that we were door knocking specifically in communities that hadn't been door knocked before, that was huge. We, we went to, down the dirt roads where houses were miles between each other. We got way less doors knocked <laughs> that, that day than we would have in a neighborhood, but we've reached the people that like people, there were there and there's Democrats out there and they'd be like, oh my God, somebody hasn't come to my door in 20 years. You know, that matters. That's building, that builds infrastructure. Another thing um, that worked in those face-to-face -face combos is Tabitha is an ordained men Christian minister herself. Um, and so her and her husband are kind of a, a rock rockin' duo there. And she's very, very, very progressive Christian. And so in Alabama, often the idea is that if you're Christian, you're Republican. Like those two things are super synonymous and it really explodes people's minds sometimes to be like, so wait, like you are gonna vote Democrat, but you're a Christian? Explain to me how that works. And she used to get those questions a lot. And sometimes those questions were people being a little spicy, you know, they're, <laughs> they were being a little rude, but she was able to actually pull them in and say, no, this is what, like, you know, feed, <laughs> feed the hungry, clothe, you know, clothe the poor, all of those things that are inherently Jesus-like. And she could kind of speak on that same language with people um, who were incredibly, um, incredibly religious in what they believe. Um, Cause you know, it's always abortion is the issue when it comes to Christianity. And so she was able to have conversations like, yes, I know you care about abortion, but let's talk about all of these other issues that are definitely Christian issues. Um, and that's why I choose to vote Democrat. So that helped a lot, especially, um, especially when we would be in really small towns and happen upon people coming out of a church service that day, like that we would stop, we'd pull over, we'd go talk to people. Um, there was so many times I'd be driving Tabitha's car and she'd be like, pull over, there's people over there. And I'm like, oh my God, like one day we're, we're gonna come across strangers who don't want us here. Um, it was never the case, thank goodness. Uh, but, and we got to meet a lot of cool people. Um, but that was, that's kind of the, the style of campaign we did, which is like, hey y'all, we're here, we're pulling up, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so a lot of that Christian messaging helped a lot. And I think, like I said, being proximate, people um, said on our campaign that Tabitha looked like she was everywhere. And it, and it was because it was true. There were days we would drive um, two hours down to the southernmost point of the district and then drive another hour and a half up a little bit north to meet, reach this other town and then drive back east and then end up back in Montgomery at 1 a.m. just to turn around and get in the car and do it all over. So it just takes like doing the work. It's not rocket science. It's just like mutual respect of humans and being there um, and, and talking to them um, and giving them a chance to like change their minds. I think we, I think on both sides, we all tend to just be like, oh, you're in your camp and I'm done. And um, that's not where community happens anyway. And that's definitely not where like political wins happen, you know, politics is a numbers game. You can break it down however you want to, you win when you have the numbers. And so um, there were a lot of times I had to sit there and nod while somebody was saying something that I did not agree with, or that might've been incendiary and have to be patient. I'd, I would like think in my head, but like literally like, what would Jesus do? <laughs> like what, okay, gotta be patient here, gotta be patient. And then they'd, they'd get to the end of their spiel and I'd be like, okay, let's, 
break this down, <laughs> you know? Um, but also, I, I want to be clear that um, we didn't change everyone's minds and we didn't try to. It was the person, it was the one person in the group of five that we were trying to appeal to, right? Um, it's, it's the communications thing, like you don't go for your hard opposition, you go for your soft opposition and the people who don't give a crap, <laughs> those are the people you try. And so, um, yeah, we didn't try to flip heavy Republican voters. We tried to flip the white mom who goes to church every Sunday and legitimate and like donates to her food pantry every weekend and like legitimately cares about people. It just doesn't understand how politics work with that, that, you know, mind frame. So that's a really important point. Um, and another thing we focused on for context, 60% of millennial voters in Alabama voted for Doug Jones in 2017. It was really important data for us because, again, the national narrative will have you like thinking that like there's no hope for Alabama. Let's write off Alabama. And that is not true. We need to be developing this year's or our future's leaders. I mean, we're we're here now. I, I have always from the time I was a teenager, I have always been like, I'm going to vote, you know, Democrat to align most with my values. And there's plenty of us here. Um, all the time. So that's that's an important note. And so we really tried to develop young leaders. That's why Tabitha chose me as a campaign manager at 23, because she was like, when you're 40, you'll have done this, you'll know, um, and you'll have all the connections. And we tried to do that a lot. We had a lot of in the college interns on our campaign. A lot of campaigns do, but we tried to be very like they, the, the mentor, I mean, the interns got to go on the car rides with us and Tabitha. Like they had a lot of access to her as a candidate because we wanted to build the bench as, as she said. I want to be clear. So I think that um, we have a rhetoric issue uh, for Democrats. So like when we have conversations with Republicans, Republicans are talking about individuals and Democrats talk about systems. And it is a, we are, we're talking at each other. We're not having the same conversation. Um, and so what is great about the church or talking about your church values is it is a perfect like pivot point for you to go and now systems, right? Because this person here is like, well, I, you know, um, a big thing was like, we talked a lot about like uh, SNAP benefits and food. And so people who would be against voting for SNAP benefits, but make sure that they work in their food pantry every Saturday, those are conflicting values. And so, so it was kind of this idea of like, oh, so you you understand an individual help, an individual charity. Now, what if you didn't, what if, what if your church didn't have to struggle to raise that money? Like, what if, what if we resourced this? What if we had structured this different? Um, and so that was an interesting pivot point to go, okay, so you care about individuals. Let's talk about the system now and how it works. Um, another thing actually is um, unemployment benefits and, you know, welfare, quote unquote. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of poor folks specifically in Alabama really resent those kind of government programs because they don't believe in using them or they're, they're having a really rough time, right? Like they are not doing well economically and then they then they see these other people who are living off the system and just being lazy and we always know that's not the truth of it all um and there's definitely some like racial tension along those lines for sure um but what we what we talked about is we were like well so let's let's think about this like if if you um you know we make it hard to go to work with welfare and they're like well how and then you explain and there's just way like there's just broad misunderstandings Republicans are so good at messaging because they are so good at foregoing any nuance. And so <laughs> having to give people nuance is what usually was like, oh, wait, you know, um, Alabama chose not to expand Medicaid in um, way back when, 10 years ago, and our state has suffered for it ever since. Hosp rural hospitals are closing. People are not getting access to care. Um, our infant and maternal mortality rates are the highest in the country. Um, you know, there's there's this uh, UN report that says Alabama has worse poverty than some developing nations. Like all of these, you know, our state is not is not functioning well without um, the expansion of Medicaid. Um, a new statewide poll from about four months ago just uh, showed that 55% of Alabamians, for the first time, which is a majority, want to expand Medicaid, and that has happened in the last year or two years because of um, because I think people are starting to realize like oh crap if I live in Dothan Alabama and my nearest hospital is two hours away 
what happens to my kid, right? Um, and so it's starting to become very a local issue for people. And I think that is a great example of how to make a progressive issue local to people and stop letting them be single, single issue voters on abortion and make them be single issue voters on actually life-saving things for their families. And so back to my, my um, points before about nuancing the world for people, like letting people realize things are not black and white and having being and getting people to shift from an individual conversation to a systemic conversation. You can't do that in five minutes at somebody's door always. Um, but that is that is our problem. Like their their critical thinking is not a thing. If you if you go to a super white Baptist Southern church in the middle of the country and your preacher is preaching about you know, Jesus and guns and, and saving babies, like that is, you've been indoctrinated into that world. And that is where that violence comes from. Um, and that hostility comes from is because they view you as an other, which is why a huge part of our campaign was going and, look at, and, and looking people in the eye and then using like the Christian talking points for a lot of those people. Now that doesn't work with everyone by any means. And I definitely had my fair share, like you said, Ron, those experiences where you're like, I may not be safe right now, um, but you keep, you know, um, you keep going. So I, I appreciate you asking that question. We don't, we don't get asked that a lot. I would like to say, I think it's funny because um, Alabama has the same exact view of California, just the flip side. They're like, ah, oh, people just go there and just kill all their babies. And I'm like, this <gasps> doesn't sound right. Like that, I don't, I don't think we're critically thinking here like this. Can we just stop? Um, anyway. Uh, so it is, it goes both ways. You don't have to feel that bad about it. <laughs> um, but I think what is really important about the South that we have to remember is that the South has the biggest concentration of Black folks, the biggest concentration, some of the biggest concentration of Hispanic folks, the biggest concentration of LGBTQ folks of any, of any region in the country. And I'm happy to track down that data for you. Um, but because I don't have it with me, unfortunately. Um, but this is what we know. We are one of the most diverse regions in the entire country. And our, our governments have been all, I speak for me, but I also speak for probably my like brothers and sisters and, um, you know, Mississippi or Georgia, or even Tennessee, when we say that, like, what, who gets represented by us, or who, who represents us in our state governments is just not, not actually how like people think, right? Um, and our state governments have consolidated power since slavery. Like our, our state constitution in Alabama was written in 1901. School segregation is still legal in Alabama. It isn't federally, so, you know, whatever. But like we, our, our state constitution clearly says that black kids don't deserve the same education as their white peers. That's what we're working with. It is very antiquated. Um, I think what is frankly unhelpful is any sort of rhetoric that says, you know, Alabama's going to go red and they're going to be the reason Trump got elected and let's just like cut them off the map, right? Like, let's just stop. Let's, that is the exact opposite response that we need. I have seen over and over again, we get overlooked um, philanthropically. Like I, I've worked in the nonprofit sector since I graduated, basically no national money comes to organizations in Alabama, even though cost of living here is cheap. Your dollar goes way further here than it would any of in any <laughs> other state or big city, right? That's, one perk of, of being here, at least my, my rent is cheap. Um, but we get overlooked so often. And what happens is when we do get an investment, we, they don't see returns in the first year. And they're like, mm, all right, well, we tried. They just don't want it. The people of Alabama don't care about this. They don't want this. And that's just not true. That's not how infrastructure is built. Um, we've seen that with the Democratic Party kind of over and over again. Like sometimes they'll we'll pique their interest with, with Doug Jones. They were like, yes, let's invest in this. And then he won. And then we haven't seen the same level of support since. And this, the thing is like, we had an incredible, going back to 2018, we had this incredible slate of Democratic candidates up and down the ballot. Did any of us win? No. But in 10 years, we might, if we could continue to build the way that we did. And so it's again, like thinking of the long game. I, um, I want to say I like totally understand that tension between like, oh, the South just feels like a different country, right? It feels like they're different people away from us. Like, why would they think the way that they think? 
And um, I think the key is, is just we access to resources is just different here and it isn't available um, the way it is other places. And so, yeah, any unhelpful, any unhelpful things about like, you know, cutting Alabama off the map or, or not wanting to invest here because people don't care. That's just not true. We just don't have the same representation um, as we might have somewhere else. Um, Alabama <laughs> was literally our seal for the city of Montgomery is cradle of the Confederacy, birthplace of the civil rights movement. Like it's got two circles and that's what it, yeah, it holds both of those things in one image, which is, yes, makes you laugh, but what it, there is no better representation of where we live than that, like how complicated it is and how racially divided it is. Um, you know, in Alabama, it, if you're black, you're a Democrat, like that is, what we presume. And if you're white, we presume that you are not. And there is a lot of that social pressure to be like, I'm, I'm not a Republican, you know, like you have to like whisper it to your friend. Um, and to be completely frank with you and, and transparent, like I, from the time that I was young, have always been a little bit more outspoken. And I had decided very early on that I was not going to hide to my family who I was. And I've had familial strife because of it. Like I have had like lapsed relationships and difficult conversations and being uninvited from the family reunion and things because I'm a Democrat or I, I don't know that I identify as that anymore, but because I'm a progressive person and I view things differently. And so I think those are two truths we have to hold. Like I think we can simultaneously understand that like we are building for something bigger. We're playing a long game while dealing with the heartache that is like present day Alabama, you know, like I think I don't, I don't know how to fix it other than to just keep going like how I, for me, it has been harder this year uh, with everything that's going on, but I try to have a lot, a lot of faith in people that like connection will get people through um, and bring people to the other side. And so maybe you're not the guy that needs to say the thing to the guy, or maybe I'm not the person who needs to say the thing, but if we can get the person who does need to say the thing to change that person's mind, to understand the thing themselves, that's how, you know, you know, Obama's whole like organizing thing, you know, you had the snowflake, like five people reach out to five more people reach out. And that's literally, that's how I think we're gonna have to change hearts in Alabama. It, will it work? I don't know, but I don't think we have any option not to try, you know? Something that's really important about Alabama and the reason they love Trump so much besides like the racism <laughs> is um, also a severe distrust of the government, very fairly, very fairly. Our state legislature has screwed everyone over on multiple occasions um, and has done really ridiculous political grandstanding that even the most Republican Republicans are like, oh, I'm exhausted, right? And so there's just like this feeling that like at least Trump is in there shaking shit up, like at least it's a little different than it was because I, you know, uh, Clinton got elected and my life didn't change. And then, and I'm still, I'm still doing bad. And then um, Bush got elected and my life still didn't change. But now we have 9-11 and now I'm scared of other people, right? And, and then Obama got elected and nothing changed. And so maybe if Trump gets elected, maybe that's when it changed. Maybe that's when I feel heard. And so um, not underplaying the, racist, the, the racism behind it, because I think that's the number one point. But the second point is distrust of government. And actually that is such a complicated that is one issue that we can be nuanced about so like I mean there's always gonna like I am saying all of this like we always know there's the people that are like climate change is fake stop it but Alabama is an agricultural state um, farmland matters and um, we have lots of like waterways lots of rivers um, obviously the coast we, we just got hit by a hurricane this week like a catastrophic hurricane literally this week um, and it does matter. And I, I don't think, I don't think candidates are talking about it enough. And I don't think we're bringing that issue home to people near enough. But I do think that could become, especially in the next five years, a sticking point as our climate here gets literally unbearable. I mean, I, I know you guys understand that being in California in very different ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, our, our, our climate is our life and our life force here um, agriculturally, so. I, 
you know, I, this is actually like, I feel like this year has caused like an existential crisis for me in my like personal politics. Um, I, I'm sure all, everyone feels very similarly. Um, they have pushed COVID-19 and, and everything has pushed me very far left. And so I, um, <laughs> I just view things a little bit differently than, I, than if you'd asked me this question maybe a year ago. Uh, but I think, frankly, the two most important things we can be doing right now is first of all, we need to be donating to our like mutual aid programs. Like that is what helps people on the ground. Like you can, yes, donate to campaigns all you want. Like campaigns need money to win. I ran a campaign. I, I remember that shoestring budget and that was really rough. Um, but nothing helps people out more like getting rent money immediately and nothing helps people be stable enough to vote like having a permanent address and there's just some of those things that like matter um so that's something that you can do and i think um other than that door knocking sincerely is if you want to be politically active door knocking and don't you know don't just go depending on where you live don't just go to like the neighborhood that that looks like it'll be easy to do like go down the dirt road like find find the people who have been hidden and go knock on their door too um because that's how we're going to do it and that is that again builds the long game